Welcome to CS402. I mean, this is the course on logic in computer science. And the, so I'm, going, I'm the lecturer. My name is Hong Seok Yang. And, uh, and, and I hope that you enjoy the course throughout the year, I mean, throughout this semester. And this course always have been offered offline. So this is the first time to give lectures online. Many things will, okay. Yeah, so I mean, no problem at all. So, so yeah, throughout the course, I mean, there will be all sorts of problems. I hope you understand, and I hope all of you help one another to solve those problems. Okay, and then the, let's see. Ah, one more thing, so I'm gonna use uh, some uh, the electronic pen, but this is very old technology, which I borrowed from my wife. And this is called Wacom. And then that means I have to write while on the pad while I'm watching the screen. So my handwriting, I'm gonna use lots of handwriting at some point, but my handwriting will be crap and maybe not very understandable, but it will improve as time goes on. And if you can't really understand what's going on there, again, you just feel free to ask me. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk about today is in a sense, give you an overview about logic and overview about the, the, the purpose and, and the, the, the what's gonna happen in the course. So let me start with some kind of general remarks on the logic. And then, then maybe I, I think all of you have some understanding about what logic is. I mean, it's a study about reasoning and it has been studied by philosophers, mathematicians and computer scientists and maybe in general public also I reasonably interested in logic or at least the correct reasoning. And let's see what the famous people in the logic field say about logic. And then this person is somebody called Tarski. So nowadays logic can be in a sense classified into three big branches. One branch is called model theory and some mathematicians disregard the logic, but they said model theory is a proper mathematics. So model theory made a big contribution in mathematics as well. And, uh, and then this, this, person, uh, this person is called Tarski and he's the founder of model theory. And another person we were gonna see is this, this guy called Frege. And Frege is the one who introduced the notion of quantifications into the logic. And, and say he's uh, again, another big founders of modern logic. Both of them, here's a quote from both Tarski and Frege, what they are really saying is, logic is really a study about fundamental principle behind all the sciences. So there are lots of different science, physics, mathematics, maybe biology, chemistry, and so on. And they're all different, but their studies are very different, but there are some common principles employed by all those scientists in these multiple disciplines. And there are common concepts that's used by them. Also, there are common rules that they, are, they all use, or common technique they all use to manipulate these concepts. And then what Tarski and uh, Frege say is, these rules are there to help the scientists to come up with the truth, or discover the truth. So they are saying logic is really a study about this truth, or some methodology for discovering this truth. And, and then in fact, as I said before, the initially, I mean, people are generally quite interested in the logic. That's because it's a close, I mean, they were interested in the truth. And, and then logic, people thought is, a, is I mean, they, they named the study about truth and methodology for finding truth as, uh, as a logic. So it's not surprising that the, the, I mean, the, the first person you will see in the slide, that you see in the slide is Aristotle. I mean, somebody say he is even founder for almost all the disciplines that we have nowadays. And the logic is not an exception. And he wrote many books about many different topics. And I heard that Aristotle was a student of Platon and Platon was more like a theoretical scientist. On the other hand, Aristotle was more empirical scientist. So he moved around and collected many, in a sense, have many experiences. And then from those experiences, he come up with uh, they tried to come up with some underlying principles out of those. And one thing that Aristotle did was he wrote a book on syllogism. And you can say, I mean, that, that's, 
which I mean, one way to understand syllogism is, is a kind of bunch of templates for correct reasoning. So one example of syllogism is what you see on the slide. They say all humans are mortal and all, no, all beings are mortal, which means all beings will, will die. And the all humans are beings. So then from these statements, Aristotle said it will follow that all humans will die. Okay? And this sounds sensible. And perhaps at that time, it wasn't really, I mean, for somebody who think quite a lot about what would constitute a truth and correct reasoning, this kind of reasoning became, was kind of obvious. And it's quite obvious nowadays. But at the time of Aristotle, that wasn't entirely the case for the general public. So he wrote a book and collected a lot of these type of templates for the correct reasoning. And so some, and I heard this Aristotle syllogism was, uh, let me see, this Aristotle syllogism was uh, kind of the old things that we have, people have in logic until around maybe 1500 or 1600. And during that time, people start to, I mean, do a bit more systematic study to so make some questions about what Aristotle did. And they try to improve what, what the, the, the things they learned from Aristotle. So one of the person was Leibniz. And he, I mean, maybe some of you heard about Leibniz, maybe not, but Leibniz and Newton are the two persons who in, invented the calculus. So differentiation and integrations, these are the ones that invented by Leibniz. Leibniz has a different view about logic. He said, maybe it's just like if we, if we when we use calculus, we can calculate how things will move around. Maybe we can have something like a calculus for reasoning, not calculus for not just calculus for physics, the physical phenomenon. So one thing he thought was maybe if we can come up with some concrete, I mean, very precise language, which we can use to express facts. Also, we have some rules that manipulates these uh, expressions or these statements uh, in a correct way. Then this, the combination of these two will give us some tools like a calculus, which we can use to, in a sense, calculate correct reasoning from, I mean, from uh, correct reasonings in, in many phenomena. Uh, yeah, so maybe it's from Leibniz or maybe someone else, but what I heard was they even have a, the following vision. So sometimes the two people get together and they argue with each other. And then they say, oh, I'm correct. And the other person say, oh, I'm correct, and so on. And life needs maybe someone else's vision. I mean, similar vision at the time was, if we have a, this type of a calculus for reasoning, and instead of, if we have something like this, then these two people can, instead of arguing with each other, they can just sit down and do some calculation and then say, oh, actually, at the end, by this calculation, I mean, it turns out, I mean, person A is correct and person B was wrong. So that was the kind of vision that Leibniz had. And uh, some realization of this vision is done by George Bu. And I, although maybe you may or may not heard about his name, Bulls, but uh, I'm sure you heard about something called Boolean algebra in one way or another. So George Bull is the first person, I mean, one of the first person who realized Leibniz's dream. So he came up with so-called equational rules. So initially, the, what these rules, I mean, I think all of, almost all of you learn about these equational rules in high school or in the middle school. And, but what the Bull's original vision was, it, these equational rules provide something like a calculus for correct reasoning. And in, in fact, because these rules are very mechanical, somebody even built a machine that can do this calculation. So, and then the, around the, like 1800 or 1900, there has been a lot of development in logic, but people start to think about, I mean, try to use this logic for initially, the original motivation was to think about a design of logic to, to classify correct reasoning. But people realize actually we can use this, uh, this logic to provide a proper foundation of mathematics. So, and then Brege and uh, Pierce, and they are the ones who came up with notion of universal and existential quantification. And in particular, Frege tried to use 
his extended version of the logic, which includes not just and or, but also quantification to provide the formalization of mathematics. But then it turns out, maybe you heard about this Russell's paradox. I mean, when Russell read Frege's manuscript, he found that there is some paradox. I mean, this, the system that uh, Frege built was inconsistent. And then that leads to a big debate, well, kind of big surge of interest in logic around 1900 among lots of mathematicians. And what they are worried was mathematics, I mean, people like it and they think it's beautiful, but what if all this development of mathematics is founded on something which is inconsistent, where you can, inconsistency essentially implies we can derive anything from the mathematics. So they want to, they have uh, some fear about this and they want to kind of get rid of this fear. So they, after finding this box in the Frege's work, Bertrand Russell together with Whitehead in Cambridge, and they launch a program of revising the problems in Frege's work. And so then they wrote a very famous book called Principia Mathematica, where they try to formalize the set theory, analysis and geometry in the fully on the logic. So they fix some problem by introducing so-called type theory and then I fixed the problem in the, is it, in the Frege's work by introducing the notion of types. And then they tried to build the foundation of the mathematics, especially set theory, analysis, and geometry. But it turns out this is very, it's not very easy, okay? So you will see that what you see on the screen is a, I heard it's a proof of uh, one plus one is two. And uh, it's just quite complex. That's because they try to formalize everything there. And then, in fact, there, I mean, at the time, there was actually a hope. So they, around 1900, the famous mathematician Hilbert posed, I think, many interest, several interesting problems to the mathematical community. And then those problems, in a sense, shaped the, the, the direction of mathematics in the 20th century. And one of, actually, two of the problems are related to logics. The one problem was to provide a proper foundation of, I think at that time it's like number theory using logics. And then the, the other one is to try to come up with, essentially try to come up with an algorithms that tells us whether a given statement about the number theory is correct or not. So these are the two problems that Hilbert posed. And it turns out the, what Hilbert wants to do is impossible. And uh, one very famous result by Kurt Gödel is that if we want to have a logic which is powerful enough, so, and then at the same time, it's, it is consistent, it doesn't lie to us, and it can powerful enough to formalize the whole of number theory, that's that kind of lot, we will never be able to come up with such a logic because it is impossible to do so. So this is the famous Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Uh, so that kind of shattered the visions of the Hilbert but they didn't really stop the, the study of our logic, as I will explain later. And, and then after Gödel's developments, what pe people realize actually the Hilbert, the subsequent question of the Hilbert can't be done because we can't really come up, we cannot really come up with a logical system for the number theory. So they're asking an, for an algorithm that check whether some statement is true or not it is, it is impossible. So, so what people did instead was they thought about some reasonably powerful logical system, and then they thought about the, whether they can come up with an algorithm that tells us whether some statement in that logical system is, is true or not. And then that vision was also completely broken, I mean, well, completely shattered by two other kind of well-known mathematicians or the computer scientists, the one person was Alan Joe Church. The second person, maybe more famous, is Alan Turing. What they did was that they showed there is no algorithm that decides whether a given argument is valid or not when the argument is about the number theory. And in doing so, they, they came up with some, so in order to do that, they had to formalize the notion of an algorithm. So they came, the Alan Joe Church came up with the idea of a lambda calculus. Alan Turing came up with the, the idea of Turing machines. And both of them provided, I mean, later became the foundation of computer science. Lambda calculus is a foundation of many programming languages, which is support lambda expressions or the functional languages. 
And Turing machine is a basic foundation of imperative machines. And also, both of them, the lambda calculus and Turing machine, are used when people study the, the complexity and computability questions in computer science. And one funny story is that I think Alan just what did what happened was maybe Church found this type of a result first, and then Turing did it a bit later, and independently. Church was American, and Alan Turing was in the Britain. And I think Turing, the kind of the attitude, according to what I read, the way Turing studied was he doesn't really kind of attend the lectures like this one, or maybe I did, didn't read book that much. He just pick a problem and think about it, and he just digest all the necessary things for himself. I mean, he just look up the next books which we believe necessary and so on. So Turing didn't read it that much. At that time, also, the communication was not very easy. It was like 90, 19, beginning of 1900. And so Turing came up with his solutions for the, the, I mean, the Hilbert problem. And Church heard about it, and then they start to communicate. So what Turing did was, after publishing this paper, he wanted to spend some time with the, uh, the, with the church in, in Princeton, in the US. So Turing became a PhD student of the church. And then he finished, after writing this paper, he, he, he kind of, he spent a few years with the church and then completed his PhD. Okay. Anyhow, it's a side remark. But the point I want to make was, initially logic has been, uh, people became interested in logic because they are all interested in correct reasoning, but it gradually moved towards the, the big interest on the foundation of mathematics. And then the, the people encountered some crisis, but then what happened was that after the crisis, the resolution of this, these kind of counter examples of the so many conjectures people had actually leads to the development of computer science. And these are the two examples that, I mean, my friend quoted as something related to computer science, maybe early work related to computer science. And Cloud Shannon, what he did was that he came up with a hardware that can be used to compute Boolean functions, so which in a sense computes or do some reasoning about logic. So he connected, made a connection between computer, some hardware and, and logic. And then the, the other person, who, who the, did work was, the, what you see on the bottom, his name is uh, John Robinson. What he did was that he came up with the idea of resolution and unification, and it became the foundation of modern automated theorem proving. And in fact, the com in some sense, the one big branch of the logic, I mean, the, well, as I said, uh, some mathematicians are still interested and they, they do serious research on the logic, but much bigger interest in logic is happening in computer science. So, I mean, Martin Davis is a complexity, well-known complexity theorist, but he said uh, when he was young, the logicians was regarded as some very weird mathematicians, but nowadays he said it's, it's no longer true, and especially for computers, I mean, the logic, logic is regarded as an essential part of computer science. And here are some applications that I that you will see. And uh, logic is used many places in computer science. It becomes the foundations of many hardwares. And also, maybe if you heard about database, you might feel that a database has nothing to do with logic, but it's not true. Query language in logic in database theory is is closely related to the many kind of aspects of the logic. And in fact. Many theoretical database people are essentially logicians. Automated verification and knowledge representation both are closely related to logic. Programming language, many developments, many new programming languages are, if you go, go to the roots of these languages, they are closely related to logic. Complex theory, com constraint satisfaction problems, they are also quite related. And you will see some of these relationships throughout the course. And so there are lots of connections in, of logic in computer science. And, but this course is not really about applications of the logic. It, the course is more about the foundations of the logic. So we will focus on many fundamental results of the logic, but we are not really trying to be a logicians. So instead, what we see is that we will look at some foundational results, 
which are closely related to computing and, and the, the computer science. And let me add one more thing to here. I mean, the nowadays, uh, maybe I will talk about it later when I, when I mention interactive theorem proving. Okay. So I will mention a few recent results of logic in, the, in mathematics, computer science, and philosophy. And I mean, this is some, pro I mean, this is some theorem now, but it used to be a conjecture posed by Erdos. So that the conjecture say, says the following, uh, maybe I can enable pen here. Okay. Okay. So this is a so-called Erdos discrepancy conjecture. It say that if you pick any number C greater than zero, and if you pick any sequence of plus one minus one, we will always be able to find the so-called arithmetic progression whose sum is greater than C. So let me, I think the best way to understand is to look at the example. So let's see, we have a plus, well, this is too big. We have a plus one, plus one, uh, minus one, plus one, plus one, minus one, and plus one. One. Yeah, maybe plus one. Yeah, okay, then we may ask the pick for this is a sequence that described by this theorem, and we may pick number like a C. Okay, C in this case is let's say it's one. And now one is not very interesting, it's a two. Uh, maybe change this plus. Okay. Yeah, as I said, this is a bit weird to write, but I don't know. We have a minus. And, yeah, we, so then the theorem say we can find some sequence, which so this so, such as like x d x. 2D, X, 3D, and so on, such that if I add all these numbers together, and then they, they are absolute, the sum of the absolute value is greater than two in this case. And in fact, we can, so this is called arithmetic progression. That's because the next element is like a 2D. This is obtained from D by just adding plus D. And the next one, so 3D is obtained by the previous one by adding plus D. So you say for any sequence of plus and minus, that we can find an arithmetic progression which is the absolute value of which sum is greater than any number. Okay, so that's what this theorem is saying. In this case, we can find an arithmetic progression. For, for D, we may pick D is equal to two. So then X2 is in this case is equal to one. So that's, this is the element, x4 is this element, x6 is this element, x4 is you know, 2, 4, 6, and x8 is this element. So if you take this arithmetic progression, the sum is going to be 4. Okay. But the, the conjecture said, for any number c, for any sequence, we can always find such an arithmetic progression. Uh, by the way, if you don't understand anything throughout the, my lecture. Just raise your hand and type in something in the chat box. So then I will explain it again, okay? So one bad thing about this online teaching is I have no idea, I mean, where you are and then how you kind of perceive what I'm talking about. So it's quite essential that if you, for you to give me some feedback about this. Okay, let's raise this. So I'm not going to prove this theorem, and it's a very hard theorem. If I proved it maybe about 15 years ago, I might have been might have be qualified to retire because it's a, one of the big questions in mathematics. But what happens there was, uh, so this is a kind of development of these theorems. So initially, there was some guy called Matthias, in, who is a faculty member in Cambridge. 
And he showed some partial results about this. He said that if not an absolute value, but if we can for any, the, if it's under some conditions, it, this theorem is true, but that essentially implies if C is equal to one, that this theorem is true. Okay. But he proved a lot stronger facts than this, but he proved that C is equal to one is true. And then people asked, and around 2009 and 2010, maybe some of you heard about so-called polymath project. So this is a kind of projects where lots of people collaborate using internet. So they all post something and do some calculations and then post replies and so on in one internet website, and then try to solve an open mathematical problem together. So this Erdos discrepancy conjecture was posed as the first polymath project problem. And then lots of people, and fam including famous mathematicians, they collaborated to solve this problem. But after intense discussions among those people, what they found is that actually it's a, it's a very hard problem. For instance, if we want to prove this theorem for the case C is equal to two, and people thought using big computation power is enough, but it turns out that's not also easy either. But then around, I mean, 2014, and uh, some, I think two academics in the Liverpool University, Conap and uh, Lisisa, they solved the, this conjecture for the case of C is equal to two using one of the generic solvers for the logic. So there are solver for logical question called the set solver, which we will learn throughout the course. And they use the set solver to resolve this conjecture for the case C is equal to two. And they, and that was quite amazing because people thought, uh, I mean, set solver, is not powerful enough to resolve one of these difficult mathematical questions. But then their proof was really big. It's a 13 gigabytes of proof. So it was not the kind of proof mathemat mathematician expected. But eventually, the, the Terence Tao, I mean, he, he proved that this conjecture for the general case in 2015. But the, the point I'm bringing this up is the set solver and the, the, the logic and the automated reasoning for the logic has an impact in math development of mathematics. And here's another example, which also some people use this, this uh, automated reasoning tools for logic to resolve open questions. It's coming from the computer science. So there is something called a sorting network. And then the, what this sorting network does is that it takes, it has a bunch of wire, So it has a bunch of wire like you see on this side. So you take an input of one and zero and you want to produce some output. And then this output is a sorted version of this input. So you will see that all the zeros goes up and all the ones go down. I mean, I don't know whether you still do it or not. In old days in Korea, we do something called, I mean, in Korean sadari, in, in English called ladder in order to just kind of mixed student, mixed uh, peoples. And then this is an example of this, but the difference is that whenever there is some connection like this, and then this connection said the smaller numbers goes up and big numbers go down. So the input of the connection is zero and one, smaller number zero goes to up, big number one goes to down and so on. So the question is, I want to design this sorting network Okay, what are the smallest size of the sorting network that I can use uh, for sorting maybe the eight bit, bit inputs or maybe nine bit inputs and so on. So that was the question. And uh, this question, I mean, the solution to this question for n is equal to one to eight was done by Don Knuth and Bob Freud. But then the, the question was open when the n is equal to 11 up to 16. I mean, for nine up to 16. And then the, some two students from Oxford, they uh, encoded this problem using set solver and solved this problem. So the solution they came up with, um, so this is the solution they came up with for 11 up to 16, the numbers were like 889999. So the, again, another point I'm making here is there are logic I mean, especially when it's connected to computer science, people have uh, some tools for answering questions about logical statements. And these tools for answering questions about logical statements is powerful enough to, 
to resolve some of the open problems. Yeah. Uh, I debase this, yeah, clear. Right, and then this is another example which where people use logic to do some reasoning about philosophy. And Leibniz, the person who I mentioned before, one of the things he did was uh, he tried to prove the existence of God under many assumptions. Okay. And then, so here's a proof of the existence of the God. And then some scholars I mean, use in so-called interactive theorem proving where the proof is not done fully automatically, Instead, the, the user of this tool have to interact with the tool and help the tool to build, uh, the, to build the proof. And then they use this interactive theorem proof called Isabel and HOL and to formalize Leibniz arguments and then prove that Leibniz argument is correct. But the proof is really means under some assumptions, under some interpretations of Leibniz statements, but Leibniz argument is correct. So that's what they did. And interactive theorem proving is another big branch of, I mean, book application of logic in computer science. And nowadays, I mean, the people are a bit wor quite worried about the safety of computer software. And large number of effort has been put to prove these softwares are correct by formalizing their statements inside logics and prove this formalized statement using these type of interactive theorem prover. Also mathematicians, I mean, the one famous example is, I think Kevin uh, Buzard was some well-known number theorist in the, at Imperial College. And he has a vision to formalize everything for up to master's course in mathematics in so-called lean theorem prover. So one of the things he did besides this formalizing the, the what he called basic curriculum of mathematics is he formalized so-called uh, perfectoid space which is the one big, I mean, this is a kind of very recent fancy development in mathematics, which made the, some guy called Schulz get a field medal, which is like a Nobel prize in mathematics. In maybe last, field, I think he got field medal in, in, in the last, uh, I, the International Mathematics Com the, the Congress. So the point I'm making is that interactive theorem proving is another big applications of the logic in computer science. Okay, so I hope this gives you some overview. Logic starts from philosophy, from the very interest on the truth and tools about the truth, but it had an impact on the foundation of mathematics and now being used in computer science to resolve some open questions and, and it also used to resolve some open questions. Okay, now I'm gonna give you some overview about the course. So as I said, the course will focus mostly on the foundations of the logic. And it will, because it's a course offered from the computer science, the, the many of the things that we talk about are computational aspects of the logics. And we will say a few words, many words about some computability results. And we also talk about a few algorithms for checking so-called satisfiability and validity of logical statements. And then this course is based on the course from my friend in Oxford, I mean, who are the James Warren and Christopher Haas. And then my thought, typically I kind of pose many, many several questions the, I mean, throughout the lectures and ask students to solve. And then I used to be that I move around, help students to answer those questions. But in this setting, it's not very easy. So what I will do now is that, I mean, what I will do in this course, in this online course, I'll do something similar, maybe give you some time to solve some of the questions. But I think you now have to be a bit more proactive. So if you have completely confused about what's really going on, and maybe you can raise your hand and I'll try to find some private kind of conversation with some students who are in trouble and you can show me your answers, then I can give you some feedback throughout the lecture, okay? so it requires more help from your side than the offline lecture. And then the, these are the topics that we will cover. The, the course will be divided into two big chunks. One is about propositional logic. You can say this is very much like a Boolean expressions in usual programming languages. 
but we will study it more seriously. We will study its, will, its syntax, semantics more formally, and then ask many computational questions about this. And then once we finished about propositional logic, we will move on to the first order logic. This is the Boolean statement with quant so-called quantifications. It's like universal and existential quantification. And then the, we, the, in some sense, the focus of this first order logic part is about understanding so-called resolution proof th theorem prover. And then the course will contain many different, uh, several different aspects of the logic. So I call it basic, but you say it's a theory. So we, some aspect of the logic are more like theory and more related to so-called model theory of logic. So in particular, we will talk about compactness theorem in propositional logic. So this compactness, if some of you who heard about topology, is related to the topology and this theorem is a bit related to so-called Tikhonov theorem in topology course. And some model theory to say this compactness theorem is one of the most important results in model theory. So we, we're gonna look at comp compactness theorem. For us, what it allows us to do is it will allow us to come up with a semi-algorithm for first order logic. And then the other thing we talk about is we'll discuss something called EF games, very likely if we, I mean, if we have a time. So last year, we couldn't have a time to talk about this Aaron Foyt phase game. Ah. Sorry, I think something is not quite right. Why, what happens? So, let me see. It said they switch my microphone to something else. Okay, it's okay. Uh, select the speaker. Okay, this is fine. Okay, so we, we talk about this compactness theorem and EF game, and then last year we didn't have time to talk about this Aaron Freud Fraser game, but very likely online course, my impression is it goes really fast. So we might have a time to talk about this. And this is another tools that appears quite commonly in the mathematical logic course, also the in the course on the model theory. And then this is quite useful when we reason about something, some computability questions in logic. And then we, another big part of this course is about algorithms and semi-algorithms. Semi-algorithm means it's an algorithm, but it may not terminate. Algorithm is, should guarantee to terminate. Semi-algorithm is not guaranteed to terminate, okay? So we will study some algorithm and semi-algorithms that answer questions about log logics. So we will have study so-called polynomial time algorithms for Hohn clause, two sets, and XOR formulas. And we will study resolutions and DPLL algorithms. And in particular, both this resolution and DPLL are the key kind of components of modern set solvers. So we will look at how these algorithms behave. And then unification, resolution, quantifier, and elimination. These are the basic tools to do some automatic reasoning about first order logic. So we will study about these two, these together. These as well. And finally, we will, that's a big part of the course is also related to the, some resulting comp computational complexity and com compl I mean, computability result. So set is a kind of best example, a most well-known example of MP complete problem. And, and then the, we'll, so we will think of, we'll discuss about this and then also we will study about the, the proof of the undecidability of satisfiability questions for first order logic. Okay. Right. Okay, so that's an overview about the course. This is a course on logic focused mostly on foundation, but from the perspective of computer science. And then we, I will now discuss a few of things about the, some practical issues. So this, all the course materials of this course will be available in KLMS. I try to, whenever I try to make an announcement, I will try to send emails about that announcement to all of you, but you can't really rely on it. The best way to do it is just check KLMS regularly and see whether you see the announcement. 
I will, if I set up some deadline, I'll, I'll try to make, try hard, or I can't really guarantee, try hard to put all the announcements related to the deadline at least one or two weeks before the deadline. Okay. So I strongly encourage you to check KLMS regularly. And then lecture notes, slides, and homework sheets are, will be all there. And then you can, if you have any questions, you can put some questions there. And that's actually much better than ask questions in the, in, by email to us. That's because you, some of your friends might have exactly the same question and you can help one another. And when you ask questions, you don't have to write everything in English. If you feel uncomfortable and you can write questions in Korea. If you can write in English, that's great. I think at least one of you, one of the students maybe is not a native Korean, but is if you it doesn't really if you feel like you can't really do it, then just writing something in Korean is also fine. And this is the information about teaching step. My name is Hong Seok Yang, and my I mean, you can contact me by my Gmail address. And then there are two TAs: one is Hyungjin, and the other is Chongmin. And because it's a all the entire course will be run online. It's a bit unclear how the this office hour will be run. So what I will plan to, and plan to do is I will set office hour from six to seven on Monday, and I will try to log in in the in Zoom by and then that office hour will be shared by this course and another course that I'm teaching. So if you have any questions, you can join this online sessions from six to seven, or if you email me, maybe we can some pre-allocate your time there. But just come and think of it as just like a virtual office and you cannot talk to me there. Okay, for TA's office hour, I'm sure they're gonna make an announcement in KLMS. And then the evaluation of the course, we will not have a midterm exam, but we will have a final exam. How it's gonna be run, I have no idea. If coronavirus thing is kind of is reserved by the end of the semester, we will have an offline final exam. Otherwise, we'll find some way to do it, okay? But the final exam, the, the current plan is final exam will constitute 35% of the whole marks. There will be four to five problem sheets and they will constitute 30% of the marks. And programming project, we will have a programming project which is students will learn about this DPLL, Sober and closure learning. And they will have to implement this Sober in Python. And then the, the way, we will, we will do is that if some students, I mean, yeah, so the, the way we marked last year was we took all these solutions from the students and run some benchmark. And then based on the behavior of the projects, I mean, that their, their implementation, they gave some marks. And then there will be also the one critical review. Last year, the critical review was about SMT Sova. This year, the critical review will be about binary decision diagrams. And that's also constitute 20% of the marks. Last year, I picked one person and asked that person to give a presentation. But this year, I think it may be not a good idea because I'm not sure whether it's quite easy for one student to give a talk in this environment. So this year, we won't do it. I might, after all of you submit your report on binary decision diagram, I might give a, some whiteboard lectures on I mean binary decision diagram. Here's the information, more information about critical review. It's a binary decision diagram. It's not gonna be judged based on the number of pages, okay? The maximum is a three page, excluding bibliography. Submission deadline is, is like essentially almost midnight. It's a one minute before the midnight. I didn't set it midnight because when I set it in the KLMS, it was a bit confusing. So it's a 2359, 27th of May. So it's have a, so if you go to the KLMS, it will show you how many days you have. And you can submit in KLMS. And then the good source, which is not very easy, is the one of the chapters of Kunuth's book on the art of computer programming. So it's chapter 714 contains a chapter on the on the, this BD binary decision diagram. And at the end, he also talked about ZDD. And it has like hundreds of exercises. And the chapter is, I mean, I found it amazing, but I also found it's not very easy to read. So if you I mean, so that's my, some, if you would like challenge, you can look at it. If you don't like it, I mean, if you feel something more easy to access or more understandable, if you Google internet, I'm sure you will, if you Google, you will find some good sources of binary decision diagram. Okay. 
And then the one important bit is that I, for graduate students, this is very well known, but for, especially for undergrad, this is not very well known. Be careful about plagiarism, okay? Plagiarism doesn't mean that you have some intention to cut and paste from someone else's writing. It can be violated without really for you to knowing it. I mean, without your specific particular intention. So whenever the general rule is cut and paste, you have to avoid it as much as possible. I mean, shouldn't do it. And whenever you quote sentences from existing literature, and you have to put these sentences in the quotation mark and put the citation there. And if not, I mean, if you want to put it into your main, incorporate into your main text, you have to use your own phrases. You have to rephrase these sentences. If plagiarism case is found and there is no, I mean, the dispute about this, I noticed something like this in some other courses last year, will, this, your review will get zero marks, okay? So be careful about plagiarism. Some other universities that I worked before, if some students do the plagiarism, have a plagiarism case in one course, they get F essentially for every courses, okay? Every course they take in that semester. So it's a very important one. Another thing is we will take a very strict rule for handling honor code. So the, as you know that these programming projects and homeworks form a big part of the course. So if some students violate honor, standard honor codes, which means they cheat in an exam or maybe copy answers or some source code from friends or other in sources from the internet, the students will get F automatically. No dispute, it's just, it's an F. Okay, so any extenuating circumstances, we won't take it, take it. So it's just, if it's such a case is found, it's an F, I announced it, and then it's announced in the KLMS. If you are in trouble, I mean, can't really do the homework, it's better not to do it, or it's just do as much as you can and then just submit it. And our general policy is, we try to be as generous as possible for handling the, the, the submissions. I'm sure this doesn't really apply to most of you, but in the, the past few years, I noticed some of the violation of the honor code and it wasn't very pleasant for me as well as for the student. Okay, the recommended textbook is, I think that reading the lecture note in KLMS is perhaps good enough to understand almost all the materials covered in the course. But if you want to go deeper and some textbook which are in line with the, what we are pursuing in this course is this book by Aaron Bradley at Zuha Mana. That's called Calculus of Computation, the Decision Procedure with Application to Verification. The course is, this book is, is more like uh, how to build automated tools, automated reasoning tools for logic, but it explains uh, basics of the logic and also goes maybe sometimes far beyond than what we cover in the course in terms of computability and uh, decision procedures. Okay, and uh, these are the extra books that I recommend. And the first book is quite fun. I mean, this is a comic book by, written by uh, Dosiadis and uh, Papa Dimitri. And then they talk about uh, the history of the logic. So if you can get hold of this book, I encourage you to have a look at it. I mean, it's fun to read. And if you become interested in automated theorem proving, another good book to look at is this book by John Harrison, the second one. Handbook of Practical Logic and Automated Reasoning is uh, one of my friends told me, I mean, this is the best book he read about logic. So John Harrison, I mean, he's the one who changed the practice, I mean, made a major contribution to change the practice in Intel. So Intel, when they develop a new chip, they do the checking whether the chip has a bug or not. But what John Harrison and his colleagues did in Intel is that they essentially brought this automated verification techniques from logics to check whether newly designed chips are correct. And they made it as a common practice inside the Intel. And so he's a real master of the, especially the using automated reasoning and logic for the real world application. Uh, so today is, I mean, this is pretty much it for today, but I mean, the course will be very heavy with mathematics. I mean, in the beginning, it's gonna be quite easy. Like next lecture, maybe one more lecture will be easy. But as time goes on, it gets more and more difficult. And here are the few things that I, I mean, you can check whether, 
whether you, you are familiar with some of the basic things that we will, I will just assume throughout the course. So what I will do, I mean, so the first one is essentially something called Markov inequality. Second one is about complexity of Gaussian, I mean, algorithm for Gaussian elimination, which you may have learned in the course on the linear algebra. MP, MP complete, regular, recursive, recursively innumerable. These are the concepts that you, you are, should be exposed in either algorithm theory or complexity theory course. And then the, the third, the last, the fourth one is the, about the regular language, fourth and fifth one, which uh, some of you may heard it or maybe not, but the, the, these are the common things that's being taught in the automata course. The last one is a, a bit related to the, the program verification. So the last one, maybe you don't, if you don't know, know it, that's, that's okay. But the other ones, they, maybe it's better to know about this. So maybe the best way to finish this lecture is, I will, maybe we have about 15 more minutes. I will give you time to solve these problems. And then, so if you are bored and you can leave, it's not a problem at all. Also, if you feel like all these things are a piece of cake, you can also leave, that's not a problem at all. If you have any questions about the course, or maybe about these questions, you can ask me through this chat. I think you can do also private chat to me. So just send me the chat and I will try to answer that. So I will be here about for about 15 minutes until 10, 15, and then you either decide to leave or just continue and work on these problems or maybe ask me questions, okay? So that's all from my side and then now it's your turn.